Good morning, everybody. Welcome. I uh, hope everybody's doing well and, yeah, not sick. <laughs> I don't want anyone to get sick. Uh, please don't. Okay, today, as you can see, I've got some things on the board, and hopefully you all got my study, my writing guide should have come in the, and I apologize, your class especially, I think I messed up and sent you two test emails. Uh, that's, I... I, you don't need to know why I did that. It was just I screwed up. Uh, so I had to resend that. But anyway, I apologize for clogging your inbox. But do, if you get a chance, look over what I'm looking for in a paper since your first paper is due for me on Friday. And we're going to talk about the, the ideas behind that paper today, not the paper itself, but the ideas behind it. And I, I don't think that there's much that I ask for in these essays that's different from what other professors are asking for in the humanities and the social sciences. Uh, basically, it's a, a kind of a normal liberal arts paper. You don't need to do any research for it at all, uh, at all. Everything that you can do for it should be anything that you can take out of the play that I assigned. I really, yeah, I mean, if you want to look other things up, that's fine. But I would rather you just kind of focus on the play and use that as the main document. But this is really meant to be more of a thought piece than a research paper. So I just I want to get your ideas on something dealing with Cato a tragedy. As I have in the, the prompt, I'd like it to be something about virtue, but that's really wide ranging. And you can do a number of different things with that. So I, I want you to feel totally free to write about whatever you want in terms of your subject. I will really be grading your paper, not for your views and not for your arguments, but how you make your argument and how that argument lays itself out. So you know, if, if our politics or our views on life or our religion disagree, that's not a problem in the least. That's not what I'm going to be looking for in your papers. I, I just want to see your writing, how you're writing, how you're constructing arguments, and uh, you, know, you can have... Hopefully you'll have fun with it. I mean, there are a lot of, even though this play is only 94 pages long, there's a lot in it in terms of ideas that you could focus on from the beginning to the middle to the end. There's a lot of different things going on in it. So uh, the only thing I think I'm probably a little hard about in papers, I and if you've had me before, you guys know this, but if you haven't, it's probably good to let you know, I'm really a stickler on good verbs. I love good verbs. Uh, so I don't like... Ber verbs like to be or was, were, uh, you, you can use those, they're fine, but I really like good verbs. And I'm of the opinion that generally, if your sentence has a good verb, your sentence will be a good sentence. So try and work on your verbs and try and avoid passive construction in your sentences. And I, I have all that laid out in the guide, but you should all be at a stage where you at least know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and what I'm asking for. So, uh, and I'll try and get those papers back to you pretty quickly, hopefully sometime next week. So if you turn those in on Friday. Okay, good. So hopefully you all have that. So what I want to do today, and I would like for Wednesday for you to make sure that you've read the Declaration of Independence and the Declaration uh, for the Cause of Arms. So those two documents in the revolutionary period. Today I want to spend our time talking about Cato a tragedy and what Cato a tragedy represents and why this play matters so much. So just a little bit of background here and we'll pull some of this out as we're talking about it as well. But this play was arguably the most important play for America, even though it's a British play. It's probably the most important play for America and the American founding of any play performed or written during the 1700s, during the 18th century. So when this was performed in Britain for the first time, it did okay, but Addison, who's a really famous figure, went on and became a famous cultural commentator and a literary critic. So he, he created a magazine called The Spectator. It's a very good magazine, but Addison was really known for that. So he was a fine artist, but he was considered much more important as a critic of art. But this play caught on like mad in America, and that's significant for a lot of reasons. In large part, it's significant because America, where her Christianity stood in the same time period, especially because of Protestantism, Christianity in America, outside of Virginia, and where the Church of England did really well, Christianity generally did not like performances of plays, uh, and that it was somewhat scandalous 
to be an actor or an actress in a play or to be a playwright in America during that time period and really even all the way up to the Civil War, you know, Lincoln going to a play was considered somewhat scandalous when he went and the fact that he went on Good Friday was unbelievably scandalous uh, and that, that seems bizarre to us. I doubt if anyone in this room even questions what's going on if, oh, you've got a part in a play, you should be very proud of that. But that's something that's very modern for us, that we would take actors as serious people. Uh, that, that is really, really modern. And that plays themselves would be acceptable, especially in a Christian culture, because what plays were generally seen as, and understandably so, a play was seen as a public performance which is what a Catholic Mass is. Catholic Mass is a public performance. That's why it's called a liturgy, actually from the Greek, meaning public performance. And that idea, therefore, was that Protestants don't engage in that kind of activity, not only on Sundays, but for the rest of the week as well. So again, the very fact that a play does well, despite all of those religious and cultural fears about a play, suggests something very powerful in this play. Now, I'd asked you guys to read this for today, and I know I didn't give you a lot of time to get ready for it, So, and I apologize for that. It was pretty fast. But I hope you caught some things. When you're reading the play, there should have been lines such as, I regret that I have only but one life to give for my country, that you should have immediately thought, wait a minute, I remember so-and-so saying that in the American founding or during the Constitutional Convention. And you're absolutely right, so-and-so did say that. And they kept quoting this play over and over and over again. So this play, more than anything else, it would be, and I hope this doesn't sound too cheesy, I'm trying to figure out ways in which we might talk about it. So maybe 10 years ago, it would be the way that I think probably people who are your age now would have talked about something like the Chris Nolan Batman movies Everybody knows everything about the entire mythology of Batman. We know about the Batcave. We know who Batman is. Uh, those kinds of things. I don't know what it would be right now. I'm not maybe Star Wars. I don't know what you guys are into, and I'm, I apologize for that. I should, since I have two children who are exactly your age. Uh, I should know what they're into, but my kids are weird, and you know they may not be what into what you're into. Um, so I'm not really sure what the common dialogue is now. But here's the, oh, a way to think about it. This play was the cultural currency of the time in the way maybe Netflix is right now. So I, I think that might be an accurate way. It, it is the language that they use. The play was a common discourse. So in addition to their Christianity and what we talked about, last week with the Great Awakening, you also have this play. And notice what's so important about the play. It's a classical play. It is based in the classical era of antiquity. It is Roman. And so it speaks of Roman antiquity to the present. It also speaks of a paganism to a Christian audience. And that, that's really important for understanding the common discourse here. And I'll talk more about this. I don't know if we'll get to it on Wednesday or Friday of this week. But the American founding period is a classical period. And I don't mean that in the sense that it's classic. I mean, it's classic. Obviously, you wouldn't be at Hillsdale if you didn't think the founding was classic. But it is also classical in the sense that it sees itself as living out antiquity in some way. And we see that all over American culture. Uh, if you, as a, an American, didn't matter if you were in Western Massachusetts as a farm kid, or if you were the son of a plantation owner in Virginia, if you had any education at all, let's, let's just take the Massachusetts farm kid. If you had any education at all, maybe uh, if you're a male, you had school when, a little bit of schooling when you were eight and then nine, maybe a lot at 10 and 11, 12, and then by the time you were 13, you had to do farm work. So that's it. That's your schooling. But even if you'd only had four years of school, all you would have done in a common school, they weren't called public schools yet, they were called common schools, but all you would have done in a common school was learn Greek and Latin. That's it. They teach nothing else. You don't learn anything else outside of it. We think now with public education, 
in our education system, we talk about reading, writing, and arithmetic right, as the, the three things that kids learn in school. Not one of those things would have been taught in school because that was all expected that you would learn that at home. You learn how to use arithmetic because you're out surveying or you're out working on your crops or getting your fields right or figuring out how much seed to put in a certain area. That's where you learn your math. And you learn to read and write. It's your mother tongue. So you learn to speak from your mother, but you learn to read from your father because it's your father who generally reads the King James Bible to you on and evenings and on Sundays. So all of that is stuff you learn at home. You would never waste the time of a teacher learning reading, writing, and arithmetic in that day and age. It was all Greek and Latin. And what that means for us, just think about those two cultural norms. And again, I'll deal with this more in the next couple of lectures. But what that means is that kids who grow up in America have for them the reality of David, very, very real to them. Stories of David, the stories of Abraham, all of the characters of the Old and the New Testament. They also have very real for them all of the stories of Homer and Virgil. So it's not an accident that if you even look around Michigan and you think about Michigan as one of the later states, not one of the original, one of the later states, we have a Romulus, Michigan, we have a Remus, Michigan, we have a Homer, Michigan, and Athens, Michigan, uh, all of these places. Because, of course, we're a classical people. And if you were, you see it somewhat in Hillsdale, but much more in Jonesville. Jonesville is a little bit older than Hillsdale. It's about 12 years older than Hillsdale. And if you drive around Jonestown, uh, Jonestown Jonesville, and uh, you're looking at the architecture, you'll notice something about all the older houses. They all have the front of a Greek temple on their house. They're all Greek revival houses up in Jonesville. And that, that was part of the 1820s and the 1830s, that they wanted to show that we are Greek in some way. And you see it on the architecture around campus. Even though the brick means we're federal. I mean, we can get into theories of architecture. We're federal because it's brick. But with the, even with that brick, we have all kinds on the outside. Greek and Roman influences are columns everywhere. There's classical elements to the architecture here. That's very, very American to mix federal brick with Greek and Roman architecture, especially Greek. So I, I want, my point here is this. We consider ourselves, for the first several centuries of America, we consider ourselves the new Romans. We're the good Romans, but we're the new Romans. And you think about something like Capitol Hill, think about the Capitol building, it is, it's a Roman building. We didn't make it like the Taj Mahal or the Hanging Gardens. It is specifically a Roman Republican building, not an imperial building, but a Republican building. Incredible to think about that. So that's what we are as a new people. We're a new Rome. So keep those influences in mind. The classical as well as the Christian have to kind of find their way together. So when we get into this founding period, there are three terms I want you to know that I have on the board. And we're going we're gonna to unpack these as we go along. But the first word is revolution. And if we were to look at the word revolution in 1700, a revolution would be a very easy thing to understand. It truly means that we start at one point and we revolve back to that same point. That's what a revolution is, just like a revolution on your bicycle wheel. A full revolution is to begin at one point and stop at that same point. And it means, if you think back to Western heritage, it means essentially that we are always in these cycles. And to be in a revolution means that we bring things back to right order. So everything's coming back to right order. By the end of this century, thanks to the French, not the Americans, but at the end of this century, a revolution basically means exactly the opposite of what it had meant at the, beginning of the at the beginning of the century. It means that you start at one point and you end at its opposite point. In other words, you go 180 degrees rather than 360 degrees. And that's the change of what a revolution means. 
So when we say there's a revolution, does it mean we're going back to first principles and right reason and what it was at the beginning, or are we overturning it and starting over again? For the most part in this class, as we think about America, we are thinking about the older definition of revolution. This one, that is to start at one point and to get back to that point after revolving. So this, we could also call it a reformation, trying to reform what had gone wrong in some way. But this is gonna be a contentious term for us. And for the rest of the semester, this is gonna be a very important term as we look at various revolutions, whether it's the Mexican Revolution or the Texas Revolution or the Russian Revolution, we're gonna see that uh, as a, a major term in the modern era really starting with the American Revolution, but then drastically changing with the French Revolution. A second point that we're going to have to talk about a lot in this class, especially in this first third of class, is the idea of virtue. What do we mean by virtue? And virtue is the anglicized version of the Latin virtu. And in Latin, virtu literally means a manly or a human power. What is it that we can bring to life that gives it energy in some way? So there's that great moment in the, the King James Version of the Bible where the woman tries to touch the cloak of Jesus and does so. She succeeds. And the King James describes that virtue flowed from Jesus through the cloak into the woman. That, that's, a, that's an incredible image of what virtue is. It's that power. It's that radiating power. It's doing good and having that good then do other good. So virtue is this thing that we don't often talk about in the modern world, but it was central to the understanding in the classical world as well as to early America. But remember, you can never, as we talked about with Ben Franklin, you can never bestow virtue upon yourself. Right? If I, Brad, say to you, well, believe me, I'm the most humble person you will ever meet. I am clearly not humble. And I can never describe myself that way. Now, I can describe Elaine that way. I can say she's incredibly humble, and I can bestow that upon her as a title. But I cannot self-proclaim it. And this is always that tension with virtue Every one of us, as good human beings, should strive like mad to be virtuous. But we can never actually reach it. And if we do reach it, we can't proclaim it for ourselves. Someone else always has to proclaim it for us. If we proclaim it for ourselves, we lose it. It, it escapes. It flees. So this is a, a tension for us. It's a tension for humanity. But it's especially a tension for uh, attention for Americans and for classical figures. How do we make that work? And you see the idea of virtue throughout the play that we have. The final thing that we have to describe, and I'm going to, again, leave this more for later lectures, but we have to think about what it means to be a republic. And what does that republic stand for? So it's not a democracy. It's not a monarchy. It's not an aristocracy, though it could have elements of all of those. It's something different. So what does it mean that we create a republic? And we have to understand, again, when the Americans create a republic, even though we all take this for granted, even if we call it a democracy, this was astounding that a republic could exist in the modern world. This is just as desirous of utopia as you can possibly imagine to call yourself a Republican. So the English generally don't use the term Republican. They use the exact same word, but use the very English version of it. They use the word Commonwealth. It doesn't have quite the connotation of perfection that Republic does. And it's also less violent because a Republic almost always means the murder of a leader like the, the king, the beheading of the king. So commonwealth, it's, it's the same word, but it has different connotations. It's a little more polite, and it's a little less violent. So the English generally prefer to use the word commonwealth. We in America almost always call it a republic. So let's, uh, but even Americans, Pennsylvania and Massachusetts call it 
a commonwealth, right? So uh, Virginia. So I mean, there are a couple of places that still, rather than use the term republic, still use the term commonwealth. But it is basically the same thing, just a more polite version. Okay, so I had asked you guys to read this play for today. And hopefully you have some, I don't, I don't care how you have it, or if you have it on your iPhone or your iPad, or if you've got some brain implant where you can see it on your iPad. I have no idea how the new technology works. Um, if you want to read it on your laptop, whatever it is, or you printed it out, I, I want to look at it. A few of you actually bought the book. Uh, so you don't have to. You can bring it in any way you want. But I want to just start by looking at the prologue. And if someone would read the prologue, I would very much appreciate it. So I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, David, go ahead. Thank you. To wake the soul by tender strokes of art, to raise the genius and to mend the heart, to make mankind in conscience, in conscious virtue bold, live over each scene and be what they behold. For this the tragic muse first trod the stage, commanding tears to stream through every age. Tyrants no more their savage nature kept, and foes to virtue wondered how they wept. Our author shuns by vulgar springs to move the hero's glory or the virgin's love. In, pity, in pitying love we but our weakness show, and wild ambition well deserves its woe. Here tears shall flow from a more generous cause, such tears as patriots shed for dying laws. He bids your breasts with ancient ardor rise, and calls forth Roman drops from British eyes. Virtue confessed in human shape he draws, what Plato thought and godlike Cato was. No common object to your sight displays, but what with pleasure, it, what with, what with pleasure heaven itself surveys, a brave man struggling in the storms of fate, and greatly falling with a fa with a falling state. While Cato gives his little senate laws, what bosom beats not in his country's cause? Who sees him act but envies every deed? Who hears him groan and does not wish to bleed? Even then, proud Caesar, midst triumphal cars, the spoils of nations and the pomp of wars ignobly vain and impotently great, showed Rome her Cato's figure drawn in state. As her dead father's reverend image passed, the pomp was darkened and the day o'ercast. The triumph ceased, tears gushed from every eye. The world's great victor passed unheeded by. Her last good man dejected Rome adored and honored Caesar's less than Cato's sword. Britons, attend, be worth like this approved, and show you have the virtue to be moved. With honest scorn, the first famed Cato viewed Rome learning arts from Greece, whom she subdued. Our scene precariously subsists too long on French translation and Italian song. Dare to have sense yourselves, assert the stage, be justly warmed with your own native rage. Such plays alone should please a British ear, as Cato's self had not disdained to hear. Okay, very good. So there's a lot to unpack in this from what David just read. So who is being addressed? And why? Yeah, Leo. He's addressing the British population. Why? What is it about them? What's, why do they matter more than the French or the Italian? Is it just coincidence that Addison's a Brit and therefore he's performing this in Britain? Or is he trying to do something else here? Leo, you want to take it a bit further? Or? Um, is it the they have or is he kind of drawing an uh, origin between kind of England's government and like their descendants of their own? Empire? Okay, that's part of it. But notice he, he could have said he's giving this play in London. He could have just said Englishmen hmm. or Anglo Saxons. Lend me your ears. Why does he say Britons and British? With John. Uh, Paul, I'm sorry, Paul. Paul. Sorry about that. <laughs> Was that is he almost calling on their like ancient ancestry? Because that was kind of what they referred to back in the day. Yeah. Where's the term Britain come from? It's it's the Roman name for the British Isles. That's where it comes from. So he's drawing upon that and he's saying, look, just because the French and the Italians speak a Latin ape language, a romantic language. Don't be fooled into thinking that they're the proper descendants of Rome. You are. You Brits, we Brits, we're the proper descendants of Rome. And he says this, be justly warmed with your own native rage. Right, so this, 
you should lay claim to that heritage. And you think about it, it's not just Addison. I'm sure some of you, you know the very famous lines of modern major general. Think about all of that play and the idea, what are we? Well, from Marathon to Waterloo? Who are we, Brits? My gosh, we've been fighting for the West forever. Well, there were no Brits at Marathon. <laughs> but they clearly were at Waterloo. That's, that's a long British tradition. That idea of we fight for the West. Right? That's what we're going for. In World War I, the posters, David, you may remember this. We talked about this in Tolkien class. But in World War I, yeah, the posters that recruited at Oxford, if you were in a blue-collar area, the posters said, fight for Kitchener's army, Kitchener being the head of the British army. So I, I want you. It's where we get the Uncle Sam, I want you poster. But in colleges, it was defend fairyland, right? which was another way of saying defend Western civilization. But it was defend elfland or fairyland. Those were the posters that went up in Oxford and Cambridge. So th this idea, there's a long British tradition there of that. But... We've got to think about this because for us, it's the Americans who consider themselves the real Romans and the real British. Right? That, that's, that's fascinating that it's going to be that. Okay, what else do we see? What, what's described here in what David just read? What kind of images do we get of this in this prologue by Mr. Alexander Pope, which of course is a fiction. Pope did not write this. What's the Commonwealth like? What do we know about it? Helen? Thoughts? Um, the Commonwealth of... Yeah, what's a, a, a Commonwealth? The one he's describing here. Um, what kind of words does he use? Uh, crap, I don't know. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> I mean, think about this, right? This is what Plato thought, mm -hmm. but what godlike Cato was. So there have been those who have envisioned what this thing is, but it seems only to have existed in the divine realm. So, so far, a republic, if it's going to exist, has really only existed in our minds. Think about the title of the book. Why is it a tragedy? And we even get it in the prologue. Why? What happens to our hero? He dies. What, how does he die? <coughs> He commits suicide. I mean, talk about a double tragedy. One, he's dead. Two, he does it himself. I mean, this is, and of course, historically, that's true. That's exactly what Cato the Younger did. He took his own life, which at the time was acceptable for a Stoic. It was acceptable to commit suicide in extreme circumstances right, in order to prevent oneself from being tempted to do wrong by a captor. Now, Obviously, as Brad, as your professor, as your friend, as your would-be dad, don't ever do this. But we can understand when we put it into the times what Cato is trying to do. But Addison is a very devout Christian. Very devout. So, I mean, this is a kind of regular, you know, every Sunday, maybe even every day, going to church kind of guy. So he's got to figure this out, too. His hero is a pagan who killed himself. So he's got to work that in some, some way. So what's the tragedy? Tragedy is not just that Cato is gone. What does Cato represent? He represents the Republic. And that may be gone. So notice that the Republic is alive as long as we believe in a Republic, even if there isn't a Republic in existence. If it's in your heart, if it's in your soul, if it's in your mind, like Plato, it's real in some way. Okay, now, I want you to envision something else. We've got to be politically incorrect here for a moment. Did you catch the stage directions and who is actually giving the speech supposedly written by Alexander Pope? Which actor in the play is the one who gives the speech? David. The prince, the Numidian prince. Ah, so talk about that for a moment. So Juba is like, he's a character who's not Roman, but he sees... Rome and Cato and wants to be virtuous like Roman Cato. Okay. So he's kind of outside, but he almost is grafted into that Roman virtue okay. in the story. So really I mean, cool. be, be descriptive for a moment. Okay, yeah. If, so he's, if he's, I needed to cast someone for this play to be Juba, who would I cast? He, he's, he's black. He is black. All right, we have got to be clear about that. This is an African. 
I, and imagine, and I say this, I want you to think about this. We're in 1717. And not just that, George Washington has this play performed probably seven times during the winter at Valley Forge. Now, George Washington's a slave owner. He doesn't give up his slaves until the very end, and then he frees them, but not until the end. We'll talk about that. But when he writes letters as a young man, George Washington signs his letters Juba. How do we reconcile that? What's going on here? How can George Washington hold a man in captivity and yet believe that that same man could be a hero? What, what's happening here? Yeah, Viga. Uh, there's a, a line somewhere, in, I don't know where. But, That's um, okay. Where he says that basically, like, Juba, like, I think this is after, you know, I don't remember. But there's a part where they're trying to make some sort of judgment call on Juba. Hmm? And they just say that his heart is, like, after, like, it's a noble yeah. Roman heart. And so I feel like, Washington maybe justified it, thinking like Juba is not even necessarily African. Like okay. He's trying to take on the traits of a Roman, and he's basically, he kind of has an identity crisis. Whereas he would probably look at his slaves and be like, you have no such desire in your heart to be Roman or like American. So maybe there's a disconnect. Okay, this is excellent, Vika. So you're, you're in Act 4, Scene 4. And I, let's all turn there. This is, uh, for those of you of the same version I do, it's on page 84. No, I'm sorry, not 84. The wrong page. Oh, I'm sorry, guys, hold on one second. It is on page 82. But it is Act 4, Scene 4, yeah, page 82. And we have this moment here where Juba enters the scene. And Cato, of course, Cato, I hope you caught this. Cato, he's not only the last of the Romans. Cicero's still around, by the way. And Cicero's going to last a, a, another year or two. But of those actually on the battlefield, Cicero's old, right? Of those who can actually fight, Cato, the younger, is the one who's out there fighting, who's doing the fighting and leading troops. And he represents, he's always stiff, but the whole idea of the play is he's just this kind of pillar. He's a pillar of tradition and wisdom. And even his suicide, which you would think might be exciting, is not exciting at all. It takes forever for him to die. Right? He just keeps bleeding out. And as he's bleeding out, it gives him time to talk to everybody and think about what he's doing. It's, it doesn't make a lot of sense except for a play. And you can also feel Addison saying, my hero's killing himself. This is not... <laughs> We can't do this. How do I figure this out? He's trying to work this out. But I love this image. Juba, of course, is in love with Cato's daughter. You guys think about that for a moment, right? Don't. <laughs> That's pretty amazing in all kinds of ways. So here comes this African, and he comes in. I blush and am confounded to appear before thy presence, Cato. And Cato's genuinely puzzled. What's thy crime? He's expecting, oh man, everything's gone south. Now even Juba's gone bad? Juba, I'm a Numidian. Wait, what? What's your crime? Well, I'm a black guy. What? That's a crime? What are you talking about? I'm an African. What, what does that mean? Cato says, and a brave one, thou hast a Roman soul. Well, obviously, he doesn't have a Roman soul. Not in the way we think of it. It's not his climate. It's not his soil. It's not his ethnicity. It's not his people. He's not Italian. right? He's African. But you have a Roman soul. Juba, hast thou not heard of my false countrymen? Guilt by association. Some other black guy did something wrong. Therefore, we're all bad. <laughs> What's Cato saying? Are you crazy? Young prince. Falsehood and fraud shoot up in every soil. The product of all climates. What do you think we're doing here? Rome has its Caesar. There's nothing virtuous about being this skin color or that skin color or not being that or being male or female. There's nothing virtuous in any of that. The only thing that matters is what you do with what you're given. It's all that matters. 
And this, this is an amazing statement when we think about, and I bring this up, I'm not trying to just be shocking, but we all live in an era that is so crazily sensitive about issues like race and gender. And then you get a play like this that just blows it all out the door completely. And it's not just some random, and we're not just picking, cherry picking here and saying, oh, look, here's a play that showed black people is good. This is the play that inspires almost every one of the founders and inspires those men who are starving and bootless in freezing weather to keep going during that winter at Valley Forge. They keep going. Why? They keep seeing this play performed. And every time they see the play performed, who's the real hero of the story? Someone that they may have just enslaved moments earlier. There's an incredible paradox and irony in that that is not lost on these people. There is a reason that in the end, Washington will free his slaves. There's a reason for that. There's a reason that people begin to think, maybe this is wrong. And part of it is the drama. It's not only this. Yeah, once you say all men are created equal, you've kind of blown it in the sense of being a bigot. Right? You basically have just destroyed all bigotry. You can't kind of say all men are equal and then get around it. So you put that out and now it's there. You're going to have to live up to it. It may take you a century, but you've got to live up to it. And that's exactly what's going on here as well. And that's a powerful statement. I mean, just imagine Cato telling Juba, Julius Caesar is my countryman. Julius Caesar is the enemy. There's nothing virtuous about being a Roman, but you might have a Roman soul. Vega. Um, does this set up, I guess, the tension that America will have to explain what does it mean to be American and basically takes down the, I was like, I don't know, great great granddaughter of the American yep. Revolution versus yep. the third generation immigrant, <laughs> Puerto Rico, or whatever. Yeah. Um, but does it, I guess, like to funnel that down, my question more is like, does to be American become like a belief versus a like, Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, this is, and it's, this is the great thing, right? And I love the way you put it, Vika, because it, it's not about your inheritance. It's about your belief. And America, as we'll see it, has developed as an idea, but it's a universal <laughs> idea. If America ever has the idea that it can exclude a person because of something like skin color or sex, it can't be America. I mean, that, that's what we're going to see here is this tension. And it's an incredible tension. I'm not saying Americans don't do it. They do it all the time. We're as bigoted as anybody. But it's fundamentally contradictory to what it means to be an American. And that, that's, that's part of this that's going to be very strong here. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're nailing it. I mean, that's, and we've got to keep thinking about this. And how do we live with that as Americans? How can we proclaim one thing and then put Martin Luther King in jail? Right? That... This is, and we know it's wrong. And that Washington performing this play knows it's wrong to have slaves. And that, he's got to work that out. And he will. And it's not pretty, but he'll, he will. But it's going to take that fundamental idea who are we? And notice what does it mean to be an American it has nothing to do with soil, right? Nothing. Let's see, I mean, next, what do we see right here? Uh, Cato says, Look at the bottom of that page on 82. Tis just to give applause where it is deserved. Thy virtue, prince, has stood the test of fortune. Now, some of you may have caught this. Addison sneaking in Christian theology here. This is straight out of 1 Corinthians. Right? So what do we have? Like purest gold that tortured in the furnace, it comes out more bright and brings forth all its weight. So the irony is... In your suffering, Juba, you became greater, not lesser. In your suffering, you became more gold. In fact, your gold that had been corrupted in that suffering became better gold. And of course, that's straight out of Paul. Right? We will be saved, but as one, if our works are as straw, they will burn. If they're of gold, they will shine. You know, and that, that's incredible. And so we, we get that in here. But that's what it means. And if we jump back, so Viga, your point is beautiful. And I want to jump back a little bit 
because we have a moment where Juba defines what it means to be a Roman. And you guys forgive me, I had this all marked and then I lost it in my excitement. Where he, uh, he gives the, the speech about the liberal arts. What is a, where we rest, what is a Roman, a Roman soul restrains? You guys know what I'm talking about? Anybody know the page or? Oh, here it is. It's page 18 in my, in my version. So act one, uh, scene four, act one. Juba says, these are all virtues of a meaner rank. Perfections. Now no, notice the language here. I love this. They are perfections that are placed in bones and nerves. A Roman soul is bent on higher views. So notice what's going on here. In human nature, the nature's been corrupted, but it's still there. We still, in our very bones and nerves, know what is right and wrong. Even when we don't do it, we know it. A Roman soul is bent on higher views to civilize the rude, unpolished world and lay it under the restraint of laws to make man mild and sociable to man. Man is by nature meant to live in a polis. To cultivate the wild, licentious savage with wisdom, discipline, and liberal arts. The embellishments of life, virtues like these, make human nature shine, reform the soul, and break our fierce barbarians into men. Now, I don't mean to be too weird about this, but can't you hear Dr. Arne giving the same speech? Is that not the most Arnian thing you've ever heard? Hey, what is college about? It is about restraining our worst aspects and unleashing our best. And notice what the view of man is. We're not completely evil, and we're not completely good. We're a mix. And somehow we have to figure out how do we allow the evil that is within us to be tamped down and the good that is within us to be elevated. And, that, and that's what this whole play is about. This whole play is about finding your true character. It's about finding what you are meant to be. And that's why it becomes so important. So I want you guys to think about this, and I love this. Absolutely love this. George Washington. I'm going to talk a lot about Washington. I love Washington. To the point, it's probably a little freaky how much I love Washington. But I just think he's amazing. And Washington, as you may know, and we'll go through all this, but on March 15th of 1783, on the Ides of March, Washington is offered a dictatorship. All of his officers say to him they will march with him on Congress to disband the U.S. government and to create a monarchy under Washington. All true. And Washington's horrified by this. And he calls all of his officers together, and he gives probably the greatest speech he ever gave. It's a very long speech that he gives to his men, in which he tell, tells them, why would you do this? What do you think we just fought this war for? What, what would you say to the dead if you told them that after what they gave, you would now put me on the throne? But then he turns it around and does this beautiful thing. He says, no, I, I call on the best of you. I call on you to strive for perfection in a world where there is none. And then he gives this whole long speech, and it's word for word from Cato. And I, I just imagine that for a moment. What if, and why not? What if his hero had been Alexander the Great? What if George Washington's hero had been Alexander or Julius Caesar or Augustus Caesar? What if George Washington's hero was not Cato? The world would be utterly different. I mean, can you imagine who in the world really gives up all that power? Well, Frodo. But my gosh, that's just pure fiction, right? But in reality, we have an example. We have a great example. And they're a really great example. And you know, to me, and this Vega, to that question, it doesn't matter that Washington's white or Virginian or Church of England. What matters is he did the absolute right thing at the moment of crisis, where most of us would fail. Washington did the right thing. And it sets the pattern. That becomes the norm, right? Not pomp, not 
all of this just kind of glamour and ritz. But reality becomes something good in some way. And so here's the, the I think, the beautiful aspect of the play. If you look to Act 5 in the play, you have this moment where Cato's dying. And of course, he's dying for a long time. But I love this image. This is on, for those of us who have the same copy, it's on page 88. It's the very beginning of Act 5, Scene 1. And what do we find? I love the stage directions. Cato, alone, sitting in a thoughtful posture. I love that. He's the thinker, sitting in a thoughtful posture. In his hand is the dialogue of Plato, the Phaedo, right? which is all about, do we have an immortal soul or not? And next to him is the sword. So he's cut himself and he's committed suicide, which from a Christian perspective, of course, is the greatest sin you can ever commit. Right, to take one's own life. Not that there's not mercy, but no, it is the gravest sin. He takes his own life, and he's sitting there. Now, there's no... He, this guy's a pagan. He's not going to have the Old Testament with him. He's not going to have the Torah. He's not going to have writings from Paul. He's got the next best thing that a pagan can have. He's got the greatest pagan writing on immortality. And he hopes. Right? He says, and I love this. If you look at what he does, at the way he puts this... It must be so. Plato reasons so well. It's like, oh, crud. What if I made a mistake here? Maybe I shouldn't have done this. Maybe I'm not supposed to commit suicide. Else whence this pleasing hope, this fond desire, this longing after immortality, or whence this secret dread, the inner horror of falling into naught, why shrinks the soul back on herself and startles at destruction? Tis the divinity that stirs within us, Tis heaven itself that points out hereafter. Now, remember Addison is a devout Christian. Think about what he's saying here. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of darkness, I shall fear no evil. And he can't say that because he's a pagan, but that's what he's saying. He's saying, give me hope, even if I've utterly failed, forgive me, and can I make it? It's an incredible scene. But imagine, here's what I want us to end with today. Cato's dead. The Republic's gone. It is gone. It doesn't matter. At the end of the play, who carries the Republic? Cato's daughter and Cato's adopted son, Juba. Does it matter that there's no real Republic anymore? Sure, that's a tragedy. But who knows what will happen a thousand years from now or two thousand years from now. And this is, to me, one of the most important lessons that you can ever learn in Western or American heritage. Almost every great person who has ever come came at the very end when all hell broke loose. Socrates does not live to see the greatness of Greece. He lives to see Athens destroyed utterly. And he's living in the slums of Athens at the end. Plato, Aristotle, at the end of Greece. Cicero, at the end of Rome. St. Augustine, at the end of the Roman Empire. Right? These guys always come, and one of the things that they do, which is incredible, they have a virtue that we don't even consider a pagan virtue. It's a Christian virtue, but they have it in spades. They believe in hope. And they. what matters is that one person carries the image of a republic. And that's enough. It's enough for it to last forever because that image is still believed. That is incredible to me. Right? That persistence of hope that we have in the human character. Not often, and it's often killed, but it's there. Right? And all we have to do is remember it. And what is George Washington doing? He's remembering it. Every time he performs this play, he's remembering. That's what he's remembering, and he makes it real. Okay, thanks, everybody. I'll see you on Wednesday. I hope you enjoyed the play. Obviously, I like it, but I just, uh, it means so much to me. And I think it just, it is, it is America in so many ways. So, 